This one's about open sourcing training material. Um, uh, we're all used to the idea of open source, but when you look around, mostly what we are open sourcing is product, um, code, things that run. Um, but there's other stuff in this business. Um, uh, documentation, manuals, all that sort of stuff. Sometimes it comes with the things we're running, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then there's training material. And there doesn't seem to be enough of this around, all told. Uh, there are a few of us give training courses. I suspect most of you have done training for your colleagues on one thing or another at some point. Um, so you'll know it takes a fair bit of effort to put together a reasonable collection of material um, and to make it work and to test it and make it look nice and all that sort of stuff. So probably we ought to be trying to run some open source projects in this area as well. <coughs> um, one of the things I learned about open source quite a long time ago um, is that if you want to start a project, you can't really start it empty. Um, it's no good saying, we're going to have an open source project to do this thing that's never been done before, um, and here's a repository, and it's got a readme which says we're going to do this. Uh, now who wants to join in? That doesn't really work. Um, what does tend to work is starting with something that already works may not do very much, um, may not be very pretty, may not achieve everything you want to achieve, but something that people can pick up and it gets them started in some direction. Um, and that tends to give you much more chance of having a successful project because people get a little bit of value out of you to start with. Um, and then they see it and they think, yeah, there's something good here, but it's not good enough. I think we should do this. And then they start contributing um, because you've caused them to scratch an itch, really. Um, there's something they want to improve, and they can see what it is. So with that in mind, um, I thought, well, I've got several courses that I've written over the years. Um, actually quite a lot, but a lot of them are variants of one, you know, one on another. So I've started with one of the simpler ones and thought, what do we need to do to actually run an open source project on training material? And this is what it, where it is. So I'm starting with existing stuff. These are all training courses I've given many times. Um, some of them go back a long way, some of these slides, uh, and they've been used for many purposes. Uh, the one I'm talking about today is LDAP Basics. Um, so it's a half-day course uh, aimed at reasonably tech people who don't know anything about LDAP. So it's a good place for a lot of people to start. And it's got a little bit of practical work in it. Um, it can be delivered remotely, uh, it can be delivered in person, um, it needs some virtual machines, I'll come on to that. Uh, normally, um, I would deliver this to a small group. I think the biggest I've ever done was about 35 people with, actually it was a more difficult course than this. Um, that was too much, so uh, we have a few things to do. So, um, there's the list of courses that I will uh, eventually aim to open source. I'm starting at the top. Um, the Linux authorization one um, is, it's got quite an overlap with this. That starts with the basis that you have some Linux system admins and they've got enough Linux systems that they have finally realized that they need a central user repository. Um, so that walks them through the process of understanding enough about LDAP to set up a server and connect their, their Linux systems to it. Half day is really quite optimistic. You have to work them quite hard 
to do that. Um, if anyone's been to the Load Days uh, conferences in uh, usually Belgium, then you might know that this was originally written for Load Days, um, in which I was supposed to present this in two hours. Um, yeah, well, I learned that wasn't a clever idea. Open LDAP admin, that's a, a full three day thing. Um, 389 admin basics was derived from the Open LDAP one for a Canadian customer. Um, I think I've only ever given that one once. So uh, if anyone wants to make some serious improvements, that one probably needs looking at because I'm not really a 389 expert. Um, and there's even one on IBM Directory Integrator. So commercial closed source tool, uh, but well, why don't we have some open source training? Um, because fortunately, they do allow you to download a demo copy and play with that. It's quite a nice tool, actually, um, for doing that sort of work. So they've all got practical exercises in them. Um, I'm a firm believer that it's a better idea to do stuff than just sit there and listen. Um, and of course, originally, this meant that you had to set up loads of machines in a classroom and the setup time was horrible uh, and all that sort of stuff. Well, these days, virtual machines. Um, and initially, I would do this with VMware and we would expect people to bring a laptop with VMware uh, and then we'd have to get it running and it wasn't too bad because you can't teach remotely that way. And people started saying, well, we can't travel. We've got a travel ban. We can't come to you. Um, and you can't come to us because actually we're not all in one place. Um, so I think the most distributed course I've ever run was for seven people working for Mozilla. Uh, and they were in five countries spread across four time zones. Some in the US, some in Europe. Uh, and I think someone in the Far East who was taking the course in the middle of the night. Uh, so it can be done. Um, so my virtual machines now run on Amazon's AWS. Um, they're mostly based on OpenLDAP because that's what I know best and I can set it up very fast and it's very easy to give people a collection of very small config files and say here's a command line just type this, and you've got a new LDAP server instantly running and doing something. So there are detailed exercise instructions in the book, um, and on the longer courses, some open-ended exercises. So what goes into a course kit? Um, obviously slides. Um, my slides tend to look like this. In fact, this is the template for the open source uh, version of these courses. And uh, there are notes that go with them. So when you print them, you get something that looks more like this. Um, slide at the top, a few bits of notes at the bottom. Uh, so it turns into a, a usable book. It's important to note that this is not self-paced training. I'm not thinking that people will pick this up and train themselves. This is really intended to be delivered by an instructor that knows what they're talking about. Um, and that's, again, something that some training organizations don't understand. However, the students usually work out the difference. Um, there is an exercise guide. So in this particular case, the exercise guide is in the back of the book. Looks slightly different. So this is text. Um, in principle, Really, these are just PDF files. I use uh, a print-on-demand service called Lulu uh, to print these. Uh, they'll print even a single copy for a sensible price. Uh, the downside is they're not always very quick. I was supposed to have a few copies of this to show you in its new guise. Uh, well, they were delivered at home this morning. Uh, I ordered them 10 days ago, so maybe not so clever there. So we have some cover artwork, we have some exercise files, and we have a machine image. So how are we going to open source this lot? Well, in the old days, I'd just tar it up and stick it on an FTP server. Um, very easy, yeah, but very little chance of useful collaboration. You don't get detailed feedback. What you want to do is put it in a public code repository, like Git, 
and then people can fork it and propose changes. Unfortunately, this doesn't work very well for Office-type files. So the source code for this is OpenOffice, LibreOffice, um, it's binary, and Git doesn't really do anything very sensible with it. Stores it, um, but no diff and no merge. However, ODT is a zip file. What if we unzip it? Uh, well, you get some thumping great bits of XML, and if you make one small change, then almost every line of XML changes. So that doesn't work very well. Flat ODT, uh, that just takes it the other way around. Instead of zipping the uh, collection of XML, they XML the collection of zips. Uh, so that's not going to diff either. However, word processors have this track changes feature, and they'll do diffs. Quite pretty. Um, you know, even office people can understand diffs to some extent if you tell them it's in the word processor. But unfortunately, it can only merge those diffs back into a copy of the original same version. So I can't publish this and take changes from you and changes from you and merge them as I receive them. I have to wait for all the changes to come in and merge the whole lot at once. Not very good. Oh, and it doesn't work for slides at all. So in graphical terms, um, if this is the thing I publish and I've got three people making changes, it's okay if I do one merge. If I publish it like this and this person sends me a change and I think, oh yeah, that's good, and I merge it, I then can't accept the rest. OpenOffice can't re-merge once you've lost the original context. Pain. However, what can Git do? Well, it can show us diffs based on something derived from a format it doesn't understand. So I could have it converted to Markdown. Uh, there's a tool called Pandoc, nice little command line tool. Um, convert it to a format that is text diffable. Not bad at all. You lose some of the formatting stuff. So if somebody sends me some changes which correct the font or something like that, I won't see it. But maybe better than nothing. Uh, I could convert it to LaTeX. Um, it preserves more information than Markdown does, but it still doesn't handle slides, so I haven't really got a good answer to that. The traditional coder's approach is to say, what are you using a stupid bit of Office software for? Um, slides are code. Write them as code. Um, Markdown, hacker slides, landslides. Actually, Reveal.js is a new one. This is sort of fashionable stuff. It's really cool, actually. Um, but I'm not going to go around and hand convert these things to Reveal.js. And then probably your average training provider wouldn't understand how to help with it anyway. So this is an unsolved problem. The virtual machines are a bit of an unsolved problem as well. Um, I had originally intended just to publish the images that I'm using. AWS won't let me do that because I based them originally on a CentOS image that I got out of their marketplace. It's a free image. I can give it to you as a running image. I can't republish it for you to start your own copy. So I've got to find a way of building an image that you can get hold of so you can try this stuff. So this is the current state. Um, this one course is on GitHub. Um, I chose GitHub because I already had an account. I'm not fundamentally a code producing person, so if you send me changes, bear with me. I haven't the faintest idea how to use Git. Uh, well, that's not quite true, but I am absolutely no good at it. Um, and uh, there are a few more things to do. So I'm going to try and um, bring some more of these things uh, out into the open, and uh, it would be rather nice if people would have a go um, and try it out. And there's another QR code uh, which will jump you straight to um, getting on with it. Any questions?
Andrew, have you considered just using Markdown format as the training course um, format? Or? I have, and I suppose if I'd started that way, it would have made this sort of job very easy. Um, but when I started producing these things, there wasn't an easy way of converting that sort of text into nice looking slides. Um, and I just got used to the idea of word processors. Uh, until then, I pretty much hand wrote postscript uh, when I wanted something to print nicely. Uh, some of this goes back serious distance. So, yeah, Markdown would probably be a good idea. Uh, and then you could restyle it quite easily. Um, I just haven't got the tools set up that way. I mean, it's fairly primitive, but it might work okay, right? Not as good as, say, a, a word format, but it's maybe good enough. Mm. I do like the idea of open source and training material. Um, our um, workshop that we did on Monday, we've already got a pull request on. Good. Published on GitHub. Um, what I want to say, so I'm from the university. Um, Usually each year we have 500 students, we have a lot of labs, and we also have open source laboratories. And the best way to go with this was with a wiki page, so Markdown, the wiki we have used, mm -hmm. and it worked perfectly. We had to rewrite everything from scratch, yeah. but after that it was very easy to, ma to be maintained. Even students have access to edit uh, and correct different stuff, and so on. So, uh, from our experience, we have passed through all of what you have described. Uh, DocWiki was the best um, was the best approach here. And regarding distributing, mater distributing materials, we have been using Moodle, for example, as a learning platform, mm -hmm. and where each uh, where where everybody has an account and where we have published different materials like PDFs, ODTs, and so on. Materials that we didn't convert it or we don't want to convert it. For example, slides, we didn't convert it with some markdown because it was pretty tedious to create pretty slides in something else other than PowerPoint or... Uh, okay, and regarding one, one, one other thing we have done, regarding the virtual machines, we have developed our own cloud based on OpenStack and it was very easy to customize our images because we had the same problem with Amazon as we had said. So all the problems you have said, we have been addressing, but you need some internal resources to do this. Mm -hmm. okay. it, it was a lot more like a comment, not a question. Yeah, I, I think uh, I've also found that this, uh, like so many things, takes a bit more effort to do properly than I had expected. <laughs> we may have time for one more very short question. No? No, we haven't. Right?